Today, we will consider and pass an organizing resolution that will structure the first phase of the trial. The Senate's fair process will draw a sharp contrast with the unfair and precedent-breaking inquiry that was carried on by the House of Representatives. The House broke with precedent by denying members of the Republican minority the same rights that Democrats had received when they were in the minority back in 1998. Here in the Senate, every single senator will have exactly the same rights and exactly the same ability to ask questions. The House broke with fairness by cutting President Trump's counsel out of their inquiry to an unprecedented degree. Here in the Senate, the President's lawyers will finally receive a level playing field with the House Democrats. The eyes are on the Senate. The country is watching to see if we can rise to the occasion. 21 years ago, 100 senators, including a number of us who sit in the chamber today, did just that. The body approved a fair, common sense process to guide the beginning of a presidential impeachment trial. <clears throat> Today, two decades later, this Senate will retake that entrance exam. The basic structure we're proposing is just as eminently fair and even-handed as it was back then. The question is whether senators are themselves ready to be as fair and as even-handed. The Senate will proceed to the impeachment trial of President Donald John Trump for committing high crimes and misdemeanors. President Trump is accused of coercing a foreign leader into interfering in our elections to benefit himself and then doing everything in his power to cover it up. If proved, the President's actions are crimes against democracy itself. It's hard to imagine a greater subversion of our democracy than for powers outside our borders to determine the elections from within. For a foreign country to attempt such a thing on its own is bad enough. For an American president to deliberately solicit such a thing, to blackmail a foreign country with military assistance to help him win an election is unimaginably worse. For then the president to deny the right of Congress to conduct oversight, deny the right to investigate any of his activities, to say Article II of the Constitution gives him the right to, quote, do whatever he wants. We are staring down an erosion of the sacred democratic principles for which our founders fought a bloody war of independence. The Republican leader's resolution is based neither in precedent nor in principle. It is driven by partisanship and the politics of the moment. Today, I'll be offering amendments to fix the many flaws in Leader McConnell's deeply unfair resolution and seek the witnesses and documents we've requested, beginning with an amendment to have the Senate subpoena White House documents. Let me be clear, these amendments are not dilatory. They only seek one thing, the truth. The President is accused of coercing a foreign power to interfere in our elections to help himself. It's the job of the Senate to determine if these very serious charges are true. The very least we can do is examine the facts, review the documents, hear the witnesses, try the case. Not run from it, not hide it, try it. Because if the President commits high crimes and misdemeanors, and Congress refuses to act, refuses even to conduct a fair trial of his conduct, then presidents, this president and future presidents, can commit impeachable crimes with impunity, and the order and rigor of our democracy will dramatically decline. The first article, Abuse of Power, charges the president with soliciting a foreign power to help him cheat in the next election. Moreover, it alleges, and we will prove, that he sought to coerce Ukraine into helping him cheat by withholding official acts, two official acts. A meeting that the new president of Ukraine desperately sought with President Trump at the White House 
to show the world and the Russians in particular that the Ukrainian president had a good relationship with his most important patron, the President of the United States. And even more perniciously, President Trump illegally withheld almost $400 million in taxpayer-funded military assistance to Ukraine, a nation at war with our Russian adversary, to compel Ukraine to help him cheat in the election. Astonishingly, the President's trial brief filed yesterday contends that even if this conduct is proved, that there is nothing that the House or this Senate may do about it. It is the President's apparent belief that under Article 2, he can do anything he wants, no matter how corrupt, outfitted in gaudy legal clothing. And yet, when the founders wrote the impeachment clause, they had precisely this type of misconduct in mind. Conduct that abuses the power of his office for personal benefit, that undermines our national security, that invites foreign interference in our democratic process of an election. It is the trifecta of constitutional misconduct justifying impeachment. In Article 2, the President is charged with other misconduct that would likewise have alarmed the founders. The full, complete, and absolute obstruction of a co-equal branch of government, the Congress, during the course of its impeachment investigation into the President's own misconduct. This is every bit as destructive of our constitutional order as the misconduct charged in the first article. Let me be blunt. Let me be very blunt. Right now, a great many, perhaps even most Americans, do not believe there will be a fair trial. They don't believe that the Senate will be impartial. They believe that the result is pre-cooked. The President will be acquitted. Not because he is innocent, he is not, but because the senators will vote by party and he has the votes. The votes to prevent the evidence from coming out, the votes to make sure the public never sees it. The American people want a fair trial. They want to believe their system of government is still capable of rising to the occasion. They want to believe that we can rise above party and do what's best for the country, but a great many Americans don't believe that will happen. Let's remember how we all got here. They made false allegations about a telephone call. The President of the United States declassified that telephone call and released it to the public. How's that for transparency? When Mr. Schiff found out that there, were not, there was nothing to his allegations, he focused on the second telephone call. He made false, and his colleagues made false allegations about that second telephone call that occurred before the one he had demanded. So the President of the United States declassified and released that telephone call. Still nothing. Again, complete transparency in a way that, frankly, I'm unfamiliar with any precedent of any President of the United States releasing a classified telephone call with a foreign leader. When Mr. Schiff saw that his allegations were false, and he knew it anyway, what did he do? He went to the House, and he manufactured a fraudulent version of that call. He manufactured a false version of that call. He read it to the American people, and he didn't tell them it was a complete fake. Do you want to know about due process? I'll tell you about due process. Never before in the history of our country has a president been confronted with this kind of impeachment proceeding in the House. It wasn't conducted by the Judiciary Committee. Now, Mr. Nadler, when he applied for that job, told his colleagues when they took over the House that he was really good at impeachment. But what happened was the proceedings took place in a basement of the House of Representatives. The President was forbidden 
from attending. The president was not allowed to have a lawyer present. In every other impeachment proceeding, the president has been given a minimal, a minimal due process. Nothing here. Not even Mr. Schiff's Republican colleagues were allowed into the skiff. Information was selectively leaked out. Witnesses were threatened. Good public servants were told that they would be held in contempt. They were told that they were obstructing. What does Mr. Schiff mean by obstructing? He means that unless you do exactly what he says, regardless of your constitutional rights, then you're obstructing. Mr. Sekulow asks, why are we here? Why are we here? Well, I'll tell you why we're here. Because the president used the power of his office to coerce an ally at war with an adversary at war with Russia, use the power of his office to withhold hundreds of millions of dollars of military aid that you appropriated and we appropriated to defend an ally and defend ourselves because it's our national security as well. And why? To fight corruption? That's nonsense and you know it. He withheld that money and he withheld even meeting with him in the Oval Office, the President of Ukraine, because he wanted to coerce Ukraine into these sham investigations of his opponent that he was terrified would beat him in the next election. That's what this is about. As the second article of impeachment charges, the President sought to conceal evidence of this conduct. He did so by ordering his entire administration, every office, every agency, every official to defy every subpoena served in the House impeachment inquiry. No president in history has ever done anything like this. Many presidents have expressly acknowledged that they couldn't do anything like this. President Trump did not take these extreme steps to hide evidence of his innocence or to protect the institution of the presidency. As a career law enforcement officer, I have never seen anyone take such extreme steps to hide evidence allegedly proving his innocence. On July 10th, at the White House meetings at which Ambassador Sondland pressured Ukrainian officials to announce investigations of President Trump's political opponents, a Ukrainian governmental official text Ambassador Volker, I feel that the key for many things is Rudy, and I, re I am ready to talk with him at any time. This is evidence that immediately following Ambassador Sondland's ultimatum, Ukrainian officials recognized that they needed to appease Rudy Giuliani by carrying out the investigations. Of course, Mr. Giuliani had publicly confirmed that he was not engaged in foreign policy, but it was instead advancing his clients, the president's own personal interest. Further, in another text message exchange provided by Ambassador Volker, we see evidence that Ukraine understood President Trump's demands loud and clear. On the morning of July 25th, half an hour before the infamous call between President Trump and President Zelensky, Ambassador Volker wrote to a senior Ukrainian official heard from White House. Assuming President Z convinces Trump he will investigate, get to the bottom of what happened in 2016, we will nail down date for visit to Washington. Good luck. See you tomorrow, Kurt. Ambassador Sondland confirmed that this text accurately summarized the president's, directed, the president's directive to him earlier that morning. After the phone call between President Trump and President Zelensky, the Ukrainian official responded pointedly. Phone call went well, 
He then discussed potential dates for a White House meeting. Then the very next day, Ambassador Volker wrote to Rudy Giuliani, exactly the right messages as we discussed. These messages confirm Mr. Giuliani's central role, the premeditated nature of President Trump's solicitation of political investigation and the pressure campaign on Ukraine waged by Mr. Giuliani and senior officials at President Trump's direction. Again, there is just, this is just some of what we learned from Ambassador Volker's records. We're not saying that aid has never been withheld. That's absurd. But I would hope and expect this is the first time aid has been withheld by a president of the United States to coerce an ally at war to help him cheat in the next election. I think that's a first. But what we do here may determine whether it's the last. And one other thing about this pause in aid, right? The argument, well, no harm, no foul. Okay, you got caught, they got the aid. What's the big deal? Well, as we heard during the trial, it's not just the aid. I mean, the aid is obviously the most important thing. As Mr. Crow mentioned, you know, without it, you can't defend yourself, and we'll have testimony about just what kind of military aid the president was withholding. But we also had testimony that it was the fact of the aid itself that was so important to Ukraine, the fact that the United States had Ukraine's back. And why? Because this new president of Ukraine, this new untested former comedian, president of Ukraine at war with Russia was going to be going into a negotiation with Vladimir Putin with an eye to ending that conflict. And whether he went into that negotiation from a position of strength or a position of weakness would depend on whether we had his back. And so when the Ukrainians learned and the Russians learned that the President of the United States did not have his back, was withholding this aid, what message do you think that sent to Vladimir Putin? What message do you think it sent to Vladimir Putin when Donald Trump wouldn't let Vladimir Zelensky, our ally, in the door at the White House, but would let the Russian foreign minister. What message does that send? So it's not just the aid, it's not just when the aid is delivered, it's not just if all of the aid is delivered, it's also what message does the freeze send to our friend, and even more importantly, to our foe. On July 12th, Blair, the White House official who had called Vought on June 19th and said, quote, we need to hold it up, then sent an email to Duffy at OMB. Blair said, quote, the president is directing a hold on military support funding for Ukraine. We haven't seen this email. The only reason we know about it is from the testimony of Mark Sandy, the career OMB official who followed the law and complied with his subpoena. As you can see from the transcript excerpt in front of you, Sandy testified that the July 12th email did not mention concerns about any other country or any other aid packages, just Ukraine. So of the dozens of countries where we provide aid and support, the president was only concerned about one of them, Ukraine. Why? Well, we know why. But OMB has still refused to provide a copy of this July 12 email and has refused to provide any documents surrounding it, all because the president told OMB to continue to hide the truth from Congress and the American people.